Hello to everybody at Gauteng Equip. What a privilege it is to be able to address you today on the subject of kingdom leadership. Well, in Romans 14, verse 17, it says, The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating or drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Verse 18 goes on to say, For anyone who serves Christ in this way, is pleasing to God. Well, what's that verse saying? It's saying actually the kingdom of God is an internal matter. It's about righteousness on the Christian, on the Christian leader, peace of mind and joy bubbling up from within. Those are the hallmarks of Christian leadership. And verse 18 says, for anyone who serves Christ, the word there is doulos, becomes a slave of a minister of, is pleasing to God. So the leader who has a righteous, his right thinking, peace of mind, joy within, is a servant of Christ, is a slave of Christ, which is pleasing to God. So what I'd like to concentrate on is the inner world, particularly the thinking life of a kingdom leader. During lockdown, we've all come under a bit of stress, and here in Maritzburg, we've had some tragedy. I have buried two men in the last couple of months who were leaders in our community, men of standing, who had somehow got themselves to a position where they thought the only way out was to blow their brains out. In addition to that, we've had a number of divorces of prominent leadership families. I mean, one particular situation, a, a young couple, the lady spent all of lockdown watching Netflix off the Netflix off the Netflix series and, and came up with the conclusion that she no longer wanted to be married. It came out of the blue for the elder, but she is, it's irreconcilable. She doesn't want to know anything other than divorce. One of our leaders uh, came up with a decision in front of his wife and in front of me, the first time she heard it. I can't cope anymore. I can't provide for the family anymore. Basically, hands over the keys, blew out of town, wants a divorce. What's going on? How do those prominent leaders uh, get to those conclusions? What's going on in their thinking? What's going on in the, in the, the state of their mind? What's going on in their inner world? Uh, I would like to uh, address some of those issues today. You might be saying, well, God, uh, let's just blame it on COVID. We've come under increased pressure. Maybe they were just faulty personalities. No, no, these were leaders who somehow allowed their thinking to go astray, their minds to move out of a kingdom way of thinking. I mean, you, I mean COVID is, is, is like a, a pressure pot for most of us, isn't it? This whole lockdown situation. In fact, in the UK, uh, I was reading uh, one of the, the UK prominent journals this last uh, month that, that said that lockdown is the greatest psychosocial experiment that mankind has ever conducted. And we're going to pay the consequences for generations to come. And I, I can believe that. I mean, one quarter of people living in Britain right now claim to be depressed. But but we can't blame it all on COVID. You know, the Bible has been uh, very explicit in explaining what life is going to be like in the end times. And I think you'll agree, we're living in those end times. And so, uh, isn't it amazing? I, mean, I remember one of the prophecies in Daniel chapter 12, I think it is, speaking about men uh, going to and fro across the earth in the end times and speaking directly into our air travel and our train travel. Back in those days, you didn't fly to and fro across the earth. You got on a donkey and you went to the village next door. And that verse goes on to say, and the knowledge of the world will increase greatly. And so we know that every civilization has gained the knowledge. But, but now, I mean, we're sitting with something like 
three billion websites in the world today. You can just, at the touch of a button, get any knowledge you want. Now, Daniel was writing right into our times. The Bible has been very explicit of what it's going to look like, what the kingdom of darkness is going to look like, what the kingdom of God is going to look like, and what this is going to be set up like at the very end of the age. And, and one of the signs of us living in the end time is that the thinking of people in the church is going to be bombarded. I want to talk about kingdom thinking. Look, look, what, look what Paul says in um, 1 Timothy chapter 4. He says this, but the Spirit expressly says that in the last days, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. What's Paul saying in 1 Timothy 4? He's saying, he's saying in the last days, uh, people's thinking is going to come under assault. And then in 2 Timothy 3, he explains what that thinking is going to look like. But understand this, in the last days, there will come times of great difficulty, for people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, and abusive. And so, I'd like to address you leaders today about what kingdom-mindedness looks like in the life of a leader. We need to be on our God. We're living in the end times. And a sign of the end times is that if it's possible, even we will be deceived. That, that our thinking will become of another kingdom. And, and we don't want that. And so the reason why the Bible speaks to us about these things is to forewarn us. I believe that the mind of a leader uh, needs to be kingdom minded. And under the lordship, kingdom speaks about lordship. It speaks about who's king of your thinking, who's king of the way things are going on in your mind. And so to help us understand this, I'm going to look at three pictures. I'm going to suggest to you our mind is like a cinema, our mind is like a courtroom, and our mind is like a battleground. We're going to use those pictures and, and look at what kingdom-minded look like, looks like in the, in, the, in, the, in the mind of a believer. And so our mind is like a cinema, isn't it just? We, we can take a, a couple of uh, cues and we can line them all up and, and we can play amazing movies in our minds. Uh, that's what being human is all about. We can, we can, we can visualize things. We, it, 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 it becomes our, our, our prophetic uh, urge into the future. Uh, this is um, what Job said. I think it was in Job 3. He says, the very thing I feared is what has befallen me. So in other words, he was thinking about something. He played a movie in his mind, and he, 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 it, it became like a prophetic pronouncement, and he walked into that very thing that he was fearing. Uh, the writer of Proverbs says, as a man thinks, I think it's Proverbs 24, as a man thinks, so he is. In the King James it says, as a man thinketh, uh, so he is. What, what, what happens? As you meditate on things, you see our minds elicit our emotions and, and we often react on our emotions or what's going on in this movie of our, of our minds. I can remember when I was a little guy, uh, uh, I used to really get worked up when I watched a movie. I mean, birthday parties when I was seven years old, that's a long time ago, uh, was before the days of videos, before the days of DVDs. We used to have those cine reels, you know, those, those ones that go, that, that wrap around. Dad would go and get one of these reels, would clear the pictures off the lounge wall. The little seven-year-olds would sit there in the lounge and we would watch the movie. I don't remember many of those movies. They were generally westerns or war movies. But the movie would always end with a lion going, Rawr, you know that lion. And that lion was a signal for us to blow out of the lounge and go in and act in the garden what we'd been seeing played on the lounge wall. And there was bloody warfare in my garden. In fact, the moms used to make sure that they found out exactly when the movie was ending so they could come and rescue Johnny from the bloodshed that was going to happen in, in the gardens of Hillcrest where I grew up. Now, as we grow older, 
we're a bit more civilized in our response, but the reaction is still the same. You watch a rom-com, it evokes things inside of you. you. You watch a thriller, it evokes things inside of you. Now, that's in the natural, but our minds are just like that. We play movies, we play scenarios, we, we dream of things, we fearful of things, and those movies have an effect on us and shape our actions. Now, uh, it's, it's critical then that we load into our minds uh, movies and, and data and prompts that, that are going to result in uh, kingdom action. So Philippians 4, Paul puts it this way. He says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. It's interesting what he says there. He says, what are you loading effectively? What movies are you loading into your mind? Whatever is good and holy and praiseworthy. And then he makes this comment. He says, whatever you've heard from me. In other words, he says, allow me in there. So as kingdom leaders, this is my challenge to you today. What are you loading? What's loading? You, Paul, when he writes to the Colossians, says, you be careful because you can become enemies of Christ in your mind. And, and we need to set our minds on things above. And so, and so what are you loading and who are you allowing in there? A kingdom leader to, to serve God in a way that pleases him, where, where there's righteousness and peace and joy, is not only got to be meditating on what is holy and what is right and what is true, but allowing godly influence in there. Who are your mentors? Who are those who are discipling you? Who, who are you running to for counsel when you're making big decisions? Who are, Paul says, let me in there. I'm saying to you, who is in there? Uh, to be a kingdom leader, to, to, to begin to see the right movies. You see, what, when Paul writes to the Ephesians, he puts it this way in Ephesians chapter 1. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart, in other words, the movie that you're seeing, the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may see me and know me better. You see, if we have the right influence and the right uh, stimulus, uh, God says, I'll reveal myself to you. And then when you are leading, you are leading with a kingdom worldview. You're leading with a king on his throne worldview. And it shapes the way you respond. It shapes the way that you act. Another prayer he prays in the, in the context of the Ephesian church. He, he, he says that to him who is able to do immeasurably more than you dream or imagine. So God not only wants to show himself to you, but part of kingdom thinking is to know what he wants you to do. And it's immeasurably more than what you can play in the movie of your mind. Now God has designed our minds to be like that of a movie house. And the promise in Ephesians chapter 4 there is that when you meditate on these things, then the peace of God will be with you. Remember the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. Serving in a way that pleases Jesus in the kingdom is not a matter of practical things like eating and drinking. It's, no, it's righteousness, joy, and peace. Peace comes in our mind when it is loaded with what is lovely and holy and right and, one, and when we load and allow into our mind uh, godly influences, godly mentors. That's our challenge, to think right, to have a mind of peace, our movie, the movie reels in our minds have got to be submitted to his, his lordship. Secondly, the mind of a kingdom leader is like a courtroom. Uh, one of the things that separates leaders from their followers is an ability to govern, is ability to make decisions. You know, being human, uh, we have this capacity to make decisions and the more you lead, the more you're having to make judgments, value judgments, and we make judgments all the time. In our personal capacity, when people offend us, we, we line up the witnesses, we, we put the evidence out, and we are judge and jury and prosecutor all in one. 
and, and we do that in our natural state. And as leaders, we, we find ourselves doing that. We, um, you know, if someone uh, leaves our, our group or, or somebody criticizes us, you know, immediately a courtroom situation comes into our mind and we, we start evaluating the facts and making decisions on that. And, and it res- will result in some sort of a sentence, actually. We, we sentence people to, we shun them, we maybe kill them with neglect, we maybe, um, you know, exclude them from what we're doing or, or say something in retaliation. Um, and and that's, that's natural in terms of natural worldly leadership. But, but, but now, kingdom leadership uh, is different because there is another courtroom. There is a courtroom in heaven with a judge on it who sits eternal, and his judgments are just, his judgments are good. In fact, every time the Bible uh, documents God's judgments, there's a great applause, and, and, and people are rejoicing. Why? Because when there's a holy and righteous and good judge judging situations, there's, there's peace on earth. Now, this is the thing for a kingdom leader. Our judgments need to be submitted for review at the Supreme Court of Heaven. And if they don't, if we are making our own decisions on what's right and wrong, and we're taking vengeance into our own hands, and we're making our own calls, we're carnal leaders, we're not being kingdom leaders, it's like kangaroo courts, it's like mob justice. Have you been following what's going on in America at the moment? There's like, we tear down the statues, we don't like the governors, we don't like this, we don't like the police, and so mob justice. This is not a political comment, I'm just watching what's on TV. Uh, that's illegitimate justice. When a church leader, when a, um, a leader in his natural capacity starts to make judgments and doesn't submit his judgments to the Supreme Court of Heaven, they carnal, it's mob justice. Now, um, you say, Grant, you don't understand. You, 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 you know, my marriage is an absolute mess, and, and um, I've got to you know, sort this all out. And uh, you're sometimes the mess is there because it's a product of a whole lot of kangaroo court judgments, a whole lot of mob justice that's messed up the ground. You see, where it says in, um, I think it's Isaiah chapter 9, speaking of Jesus, uh, you know, to unto us a child is born, a king is given, etc., etc. It says, and of his government and of his peace, there is no end. You, you want to know what kingdom leadership looks like? The government of God is there. Our decisions are submitted to his judgments. The government of God is there. And of that sort of government, there is no end to the peace. And so... Uh, our encouragement is that, you know, in the end of Romans, it says, God says through Paul, uh, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. You've got no business making judgments, executing a sentence, and then, uh, you know, outworking that. No, 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 vengeance is in the Lord's hands. There's this uh, famous Czechoslovakian theologian, Miroslav Volf, and um, he lived in the Balkans, and really wrote prolifically on revenge and forgiveness, etc., because he's seen his family murdered and raped. And, and he asks this question, what do you preach in a world that's gone mad like that when there's a cycle of revenge? Do you preach God is love and you just forgive your neighbor? Well, obviously, there's an element of truth in that. No, he says what you need to preach is God is just, God is a judge. Because if you tell someone who's just lost his whole family and they've been brutally butchered, just turn the other cheek, my boy, everything's going to work out all right. He's going he's gonna to rush for his sword. He's going to rush for his AK-47. No, you need to say to that man or that woman that there is a God in heaven. He is righteous. He is holy. He is just. And vengeance is in his hands. Leave vengeance to him. And, and when... The courtrooms of our mind are submitted to the appeals court of heaven. Peace comes. Joy comes. Why, why can you laugh in the face of adversity? Because God is on his throne and God is making these judgments. You say, God, people are overlooking me in my ministry. Let God be on his throne and leave it in his hands. Thirdly, to be a kingdom-minded leader, we need to 
understand that our minds are also like a battlefield. We war against all sorts of things, don't we? We war with ourselves. We war on a work front. We war, we war in, in a ministry front. And, and, and we've got different strategies. We can freeze people out. We can attack. We can, we can pretend to, to, to avoid the battle. But, but our minds, there's a battlefield. There's a constant uh, battlefield. And, and we've understood that the greatest battle in our mind was a battle of surrender to Jesus, wasn't it? And, and we win that battle, the eternal battle, the battle for our soul. We win that battle by surrender. And it, it, this, is, this is a kingdom principle. Uh, the principle of, of righteousness is that you, you get it when, when you give your life away. You get life when you give it away. You, and so what happened is we, we put up the white flag of surrender and said, my life, Lord, in your hands, my future in your hands, lordship, over my life is in your hands. You are my king now. And that, that's, that's what happened when we got born again. And at that moment, uh, God breathes his life into us. We become a new creation. We, we become born again. We get adopted into his family. But it happens in the heat of battle when we're arguing against God and resisting against God. And finally, we come to the point of saying, God, I surrender. Now, in a normal context of historical warfare, when a battle is won, sometimes there is a platoon or a regiment who didn't hear the verdict, and they carry on fighting. Sometimes they did hear the verdict, and they, and they decide, look, we're a vigilante group. We are never, ever going to surrender. We're going to fight to the death, and they hide away in a forest, or they hide away in um, some downtown somewhere, and they fight to the bitter end. The same thing happens in our minds. We might have put up the flag of surrender and said, Lord, you Lord of my mind, you Lord of everything. But, but we leave a little vigilante thought process in our mind that isn't submitted to the new king. When Paul was writing to the Corinthians, he called that little vigilante thought process a stronghold. So let me read what he says about strongholds. 2 Corinthians Chapter 10, he says this. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. And he describes what the stronghold is. He says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Aha. Uh -huh. So he says, these arguments... These fortified ways of thinking that have set themselves up against God, these little vigilante groups in our mind, he calls them strongholds. So, so what is a stronghold? Well, that, that is a, a concept that you'll find a lot in the Old Testament in a very positive sense. So when they built a village, they would either make a tower in the middle or a bunker in the middle, which was their last bastion of defense. When the enemy comes in like a flood, they would hide in their tower, maybe pour boiling water over it or rocks over it and kill the enemies as their last ditch defense. And I'm assuming some villages were saved because they had a stronghold. So Paul is using, he's borrowing that metaphor and he's saying, in the battle for your soul, Jesus came in like a flood. He came in over your boundary walls and you hoisted up that flag of surrender. But there are some arguments and pretensions, some fortified ways of thinking. This vigilante crew said, we're not going to surrender. We might have lost the village. But this thing we're not going to lose. And so it, it works like this. You can say, Lord, you can have my future. Hopefully you take me into your heaven. Uh, you can have my marriage. You can have, but, but you can't touch my finances. I don't want the kingdom, this new king, to govern what it's. I'm going to keep it in a fortified tower. I'm going to have an argument. Of, I'm going to set up an argument against God to keep hold of my finances. Paul says that's a stronghold. Or oh God, you can have everything. You have my finance, you can have my everything. You just can't have my sexuality. Because I know when this king marches into my sexuality, he's going to spoil it. So I'm going to keep that dark. It's possible for a Christian to have the new king in his life, but to have a stronghold, a fortified way of thinking against the new king. But the great news here, for and, and kingdom leaders, you, you, you tell me, why is it 
that those men in my church had allowed Jesus in, into their marriages, into their ministries, into every single area, but they, there was a, how do they get then with the new king to a conclusion that their only solution is to blow their brains out? I, I tell you what happened is that this stronghold, particularly in both these guys' case, on finances, uh, was dark and God never got in there. And, and eventually, uh, that, that stronghold, let me mix the metaphors now, that movie began to play again and again and again and again, and it resulted in a catastrophic conclusion. It's possible to have him Lord of everything except this thing, but the great news of this text is that we have weapons to demolish these strongholds. The Christian leader, so if you are leading and you have a fortified way of thinking that is not under God's lordship, you actually have a weapon or two at your disposal to bring that down. And to Because this is what God wants. He wants surrender flags all over. Surrender flags and your sexuality and your finance and your parenting and your, and your thinking and your work life and your social life and your friend's life. Just white flags of surrender. Lord, be king of all these areas. Conquer me. That's what God is looking for. His, we're talking about Kingdom leadership, the new king over these aspects of your thinking. So you say, God, well, what is it? What is the weapon to bring down this stronghold? I believe there are two. It's the weapon of confession and repentance. You see, they're not weapons like the world would know them. They're spiritual weapons. You say, God, you mean like, you mean like tell other people that this dark place exists? That's exactly what I mean. You, you say, Kron, like, that, that's a bit scary, and, and isn't, isn't confession like a, a bit, you know, isn't it a bit Catholic? Confess your sins one to another, and he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you. How does the cleansing come? It comes when you let the light in. And sometimes, that fortified way of thinking, you can pretend to repent, but it requires confession. So I'm going to suggest to you today that if there is a fortified way of thinking that set itself up against God inside of you, God's calling you to repent, to turn around, to allow his light in. And in many instances, that's going to result or require confession. And so as I bring this uh, to a close, in Romans 14, it says, the kingdom of God is not about practical matters like eating, drinking, you know, strategies. It includes that, but it, in essence, it's not about that. What is it about? It's about righteousness. And, and there's no righteousness in darkness. So, so the mind of a kingdom leader has got to be one where the strongholds come down, where the surrender flags are up, and the king has his way. It's a matter of righteousness peace. Where's peace going to come from? Peace is going to come from when we allow his movies to play and we see him as Lord, him as King, where we allow his governance into our lives. And it's about joy. Now, how can you laugh through adversity? How can you laugh when your enemy's coming against you and things aren't going well? Well, we have an appeals court in heaven. And when you surrender it to him, the joy that comes from inside is this awareness that God God is right, and we can celebrate every time we put one of our puny little kangaroo court decisions at his feet. We can celebrate like the whole of history has ever done when God makes a judgment and God executes vengeance. There's celebration on earth, and there's joy that bubbles up from earth. The kingdom of God is not a matter of practical stuff like eating and drinking. It's a matter of righteousness. Let's see the strongholds come down. Peace. Let's see the movie reels of heaven play and joy, joy everlasting when the righteous king, our righteous Lord, takes rule and takes authority and makes judgments in all our decisions that we have to make. God bless you guys. I trust that Quip becomes and is an a incredible uh, moment for you, equipping time for you, and, and that we walk our lives out with minds surrendered to our King, King Jesus.